Hello and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We are in the Gospel of Matthew, going through the Bible, verse by verse, through the New Testament, actually, this time around. And we come today to Matthew chapter 13. We left off last time in verse 15, so you can get your Bible, open it up. <clears throat> to Matthew chapter 13, I did mention that I am going through the New Testament this time, Matthew through Revelation, just as it is in the Bible. And uh, that doesn't mean, though, that you cannot study the Old Testament with me because there are three complete series going through the entire Bible, all 66 books, at thebibleversebyverse.com. And you can study those with me just like we're doing today using my audio Bible messages. So check it out at thebibleversebyverse.com. <clears throat> well, let's pray. And Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. As I said, we made it through chapter 13, verse 15. So let's, um, actually, let's go back and begin reading in verse 10. Because Jesus has just told them the parable of the sower. And he's going to interpret that, beginning in verse 18. So he's just completed that parable. And verse 10, the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Why do you use stories that they, they don't grasp? They don't grasp what the story is about. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. The parables did two things. They illustrated the truth and made it come alive for those who wanted to understand it. But they were like a puzzle, like a riddle to those who had no desire for the truth. So the parables blinded the eyes of those who wanted to be blind and opened the eyes of those who wanted their eyes to be open with regards to the truth. <clears throat> and then he says this in verse 12, For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away even what he hath. You see, and Jesus is warning that if you don't accept the truth that you know is truth because you love what is false, then you will someday lose your conviction concerning the truth that you believe. You'll lose it. We're either going forward with Jesus and the Word of God or we're going backwards. There's no remaining in neutral. So he says in 13, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. <clears throat> and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For this people's heart is become gross, hard, hard as a rock. And their eyes dull of, and their ears dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand in their heart, excuse me, with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. So, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, the parables, the parables were confusing to people who didn't have a heart for truth. But they were living illustrations to those who did have a desire for the truth. The Word of God is easy to understand. It's easy to grasp if you have a heart for truth. If you want to understand the truth, if you are open to the truth, 
and especially if you want to obey the truth. God says, if anyone is willing to obey, he will know the truth. So with that, let's go to verse 16. Jesus said, but blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. You know, the disciples, that larger group of followers of Christ, and especially the apostles, the twelve, they were so very privileged because they saw in person and heard in person the Jewish Messiah, the Savior, that had been promised by God beginning in the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve fell. All those centuries passed by and people waited for the Messiah to come. God had promised to send the Messiah, the, Messiah, the Savior, and for centuries people waited for that Savior to come. And it never, he never came in their, life, in their lifetime. But the disciples saw him. So the disciples saw God's promise come to pass. And that's why they were so blessed. What a privileged group. <clears throat> 18. Here, therefore, the parable of the sower. Now, remember I told you he was going to interpret the sower, the parable of the sower. Here he goes. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom... And understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. So, two things have to happen for the word of God to sink in. First, the listener must want truth. Second, the truth must be proclaimed clearly. Not that complicated, is it? If it's going to sink in to an individual soul, number one, that individual soul has to be hungry for the truth, open to the truth, and somebody has to proclaim it clearly without watering it down. If those two things are not there, then the devil will snatch the word of God off the person's soul before they ever have a chance to understand it at any point in the future. It'll be gone. <clears throat> Verse 20. But he that received the seed in stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and immediately with joy receiveth it. And <clears throat> this describes a lot of people. Some people hear God's word, and they get so excited about it. They get so pumped up. You know, they're excited about repentance. They're excited about Jesus dying on the cross. They're excited about heaven. They're excited that they can avoid hell. They're excited about living for Jesus. And in their minds, it's always going to be that way. In their minds, knowing Jesus and being a Christian is going to be a constant, continual, spiritual high. <clears throat> Verse 20. But he that received the seed in stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and immediately with joy he receives it. He's pumped. He's excited. He's all emotional, excited. But notice Verse 21. Yet hath he not root in himself, but endureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, immediately he is offended. So the people that Jesus described, <clears throat> boy, they seem to start out with a bang. I mean, they hear the word of God and bang, they jump all over it. And they're on top of it and, they are, and they're excited about Jesus and they can't wait for more. I've met so many people like this in my lifetime over the years. You give them the word and tell them about Jesus. Oh, man, they just love it. 
they can't wait to get more and more and more. And and maybe they maybe they do come or listen for a while and but then, you know, eventually maybe they get a little ridiculed and uh, it's no more fun. It's not fun anymore. We're not we're not gonna do it. They only did it because it was fun. And when it ceases to be fun or there's a cost involved, then they don't want to do it anymore. It's all about emotion. It's all surface. And that's what Jesus is talking about, that type of person. That It's all about emotion. As soon as they realize there is some sacrifice or hardship involved in following the Lord Jesus Christ, they quit. They would rather go to hell than put up with discomfort for Christ. So consequently, that's where they go. Their choice. If you think that discomfort for Christ is too high a price to keep you out of hell, um, then I don't even have words to describe how foolish you are. 22. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this age and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. This is a large group of people too, a large group of professing Christians. Some people are way too busy for Jesus. They're too consumed with making money or friends or sports or hobbies or entertainment or whatever. They don't have time to pray. They don't have time to read the Bible. They don't have time to study the Word of God, so they don't. And they end up in hell. They end up in hell where they spend eternity wishing that they would have made time for Jesus. 23. But he that received seed in the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, who also bringeth fruit, who also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Some people want truth. They hear the word of God, they repent, and they live for Jesus. They understand that going to hell is the worst thing that can happen, so they remain faithful to Jesus through good times and bad. They persevere. They have faith in Jesus, and they live a good life. They live for him as a result of that faith. And when they fail, which we all do, they confess it. 23. But he that received seed in the good ground is he that heareth the word. And oh, actually, let's read verse 24. I've said enough about that one. Verse 24 says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the, bra the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the wheat in this little story represents Christians. The weeds represent those who say they are Christians, but they are not. And notice how they are grown together. Verse 27. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From where then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? An enemy planted weeds in order to destroy the farmer's good crop of wheat. Because you know that's what weeds do. We saw this in the parable of the sower. The weeds grow alongside the good plants and they steal all the moisture, they steal all the nutrients, and the plants, the good ones, like the grain in this story, choke out, die. 
The weeds specialize in killing that which is good. And so what Jesus is saying is, in this story, the weeds represent bad people who, who, who claim to be Christians. They pretend to be Christians. And an enemy planted the weeds in order to destroy the farmer's wheat. And the farmer's servants, when they find out about this, they want to pull the weeds out right away. Well, then let's, let's just get rid of them. 29. But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. There are certain weeds that will actually wrap their roots around the roots of wheat. So if you pull the weeds out of the ground, then the wheat will be pulled out as well, thus destroying the crop. The farmer said, no, we'll just, we'll just wait until the wheat is mature and it's time for harvest. After the wheat is mature, we'll go in with a sickle and we'll harvest it all. And after that, then we will separate the good from the bad, the true crops from the bad crops, the false crops. 31. <clears throat> Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is, when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches of it. A mustard seed is smaller than a bb. Perhaps a third, a quarter of the size of a bb, very tiny, but it can grow to be a 15-foot tree in its first year. Jesus is saying, my church is going to start out small, but it's going to become huge. 33. Another parable spoke he unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. My mother used to, uh, I remember when I was real little, she used to bake every day, you know, back in the 50s and 60s. Um, she had six kids. And she obviously a full-time mom, like most were back in those days. I mean, just so we would have something for our lunches, for school lunches, she would bake every single day. She'd be baking something. And she always baked from scratch. She never used any mixes. And I can, I can remember my mom kneading her dough. She'd make her dough from scratch. Boy, no wonder all the kids in the neighborhood. Boy, when my mom would make donuts, once in a while she'd make donuts, she'd deep fry them. And I think there was probably 30 children in the neighborhood. One block. I'm talking about one city block, and it was a small one. But there was like 30 children in that block. Because everybody had a bunch of kids back in those days, you know. And the vast majority would be there when she would be making donuts. Oh, my goodness. It was a treat. Everybody loved my mom's donuts. And she used to put, I can remember doing this, putting a little bit of yeast, just a little bit of yeast in a big lump of dough. But that yeast, it was so small. Nothing compared to that big lump of dough, but it would spread. And then it would cause the dough to expand. You could not see the yeast inside of the dough. You could not see what it was doing as far as observing the yeast itself. But boy, you could sure see how it was working inside of the dough. You could see the changes in the dough. And likewise, when a sinner receives Christ, Jesus changes them. Like yeast and dough. 
Jesus in a person's life begins to change. You don't see Jesus. You can't observe him. You don't see Jesus. You can't look inside the, the Christian's mouth, and look down his throat and, and see Jesus. You can't look into his eyes and see Jesus. But Jesus is in there just like that yeast and begins to change that person and makes them more holy. And as he does, you know what happens? That Christian begins to influence the people around them, their family, their friends, their co-workers, their fellow students, society in general, and makes it all a better place. Somewhat. 34. All these things spoke Jesus unto the multitudes in parables, and without a parable spoke he not unto them. Jesus, again, used stories to teach people spiritual things. Stories can help us to understand important truths. Verse 35, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Those who didn't want truth, like I said earlier, were confused by the stories that Jesus told. They, they didn't click with them. It was just some story that they sort of got on a surface level. That was it. And then they went away. Didn't click with them. They just walked away. Those who wanted truth, though, understood the teachings that his stories made come alive because they illustrated them so well. It all depended on where a person's heart was and their heart attitude toward God and truth. Verse 36, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Explain unto us the parable of the tares of the field. The disciples wanted truth, so they made an effort to pursue it. They invested time in pursuit of God's word, and it will pay off for them. I know many of you who listen to me. You, you invest time in studying the word of God. I mean, you love it. You pursue truth. You get a taste of truth, and you just love it. And you can't wait till you get more. You invest time in it. And you know what? You walk away knowing Jesus better, don't you? You better believe it. You know you do. I hear from you. And I've experienced it too, but it takes effort. It takes effort to spend time studying the Word of God. So the disciples obviously were that way. They followed Jesus right in the house. Hey, can you explain to us what that parable of the tares means? Appreciate it. Verse 37, He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. Verse 38, The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. As I mentioned when he first told this parable. In other words, the good seed represents saved people. Jesus is the one who saves people. We cannot do it by being clever. We cannot do it through manipulation or trying to be cool. Jesus is the one who saves people. All we can do is proclaim the word of God and pray that people receive it. That's it. Can't do any more than that. Doesn't, it doesn't matter how eloquent you are as a speaker. It doesn't matter how aggressively you speak the word of God. It doesn't matter what kind of words you use, big words, and nobody understands. That's just a detriment to it all. Nothing matters. Nothing matters. It's just the simple word of God. Jesus takes it, and he makes Christians from that word. 38. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. So when Jesus returns, 
Did you know that he's going to bring all of his angels with him? As far as I know from reading the Bible for almost 40 years now, that is the only time ever mentioned in Scripture anyway that we know of where all the angels, well, I was going to say where they were all in one place, but I think they were all in one place too when God created the heavens and the earth back in Genesis chapter 1 because the Bible says that the, that the stars, speaking of angels, rejoiced. I mean, they were all there witnessing creation, I guess. But this is the only other time that they were all in one place, and that's to accompany Jesus back to earth. Man, the sky's going to be filled with them. There won't be enough sky, space around the whole planet to stuff all those angels, I think. There's so many of them. So when Jesus returns, he's bringing all of his angels with him, and he's going to send those angels to gather up those who have rejected him. Jesus will judge them, and he will then send them to hell forever. 40. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this age. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them who do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. When Christ returns, as we saw, God will send forth his countless number of angels to gather all impenitent, Christ-rejecting sinners, all damned souls. He's going, to, he's going to have the angels gather them all up. Jesus is going to judge them and send them to hell. So God will remove all sinners who have refused his offer of forgiveness through the work of his son Jesus Christ on the cross. There will be no sin, therefore, on the new earth. Jesus will punish sinners in hell, and that's where they will remain suffering forever. There will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. By the way, folks, you don't do that if you get annihilated when you get thrown into the lake of fire. You just puff, gone, which is what a lot of Modern evangelicals are now teaching because it certainly does soothe the guilty conscience and ease the, the fears of those who are on their way to hell and also friends and, and loved ones of those who have died and gone to hell. It's not such a horrible thing to think about that they've just ceased to exist. But my friends, that's not true and you don't do anybody any favors when you water down the word of God and make it say something that it does not say, there is weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth for people who go to hell. That means they're conscious. And they will remain there forever. It is going to be horrible for the wicked. And it will be terrible, horrible, nonstop. Those who reject Christ are going to suffer forever. We'll pick it up in verse 44 next time. If you would like to study the Word of God with me further, you can at the thebibleversebyverse.com. And again, like I mentioned at the beginning of the broadcast, if you want to study the Old Testament with me, you sure have ample opportunity to do it there because there are three complete series going through the whole Bible, Old Testament and New. You can study it all at your pace, at your convenience, using my audio Bible messages. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. So check it out. While you are there, please remember that I'm not underwritten by any large church or denomination. For well over 30 years, this has been a faith ministry where I just teach the Word of God. I'm obedient to God the best that I can, teaching His Word as clearly as I can, and trusting that He will supply so if you want to be a part of this ministry and join me and help me to get out the Word of God, pray for me, pray for the Word. Click the Donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give us the Lord may lead. 
Until next time, so long, everyone.